which are five volumes which have been published at a German university, mainly in German, in some Yiddish, extensive footnotes, and the tools applied to translate it into Polish, because they have no information that they can access readily. But the problem is money, they have no money. While we were talking, they had a page and they showed it to me and they said something about green and they assumed we were talking about the garden. The sentence when I constructed it from the, from the German back into Polish meant it was a green person or a greener, which meant a new arrival. So <coughs> one has to be very careful when leaving those old papers which date back over I came to power in 1933 when I was eight years old. At first, what I heard at home was it's temporary, things will change. But by summer of that year, things had gotten worse. The neighbor children would no longer play with us. They would no longer talk to us. The men appeared in brown uniforms. It was no more good morning. It was silent. My parents were Polish nationals. We lived in Germany due to my father's business. But it was frightening to a child. I went to a private Jewish school. Children were slowly leaving the country, South America, North America, some to Madagascar, to Palestine, all over the world. When I asked at home, why aren't we leaving? The answer was, this is temporary. We don't have to leave. We have the protection of the consulate, of the Polish consul, and then we can touch it. Regrettably, this was not. In 1938, the Poles pushed the Jews, and there were about 10,000 Jews or 15,000, over the German-Polish border and did not want to honor their passports. My father among them. He returned six months later and tried to obtain papers for Palestine. It was rather difficult. In the meantime, there was an incident at the school in 1938. The merchandise of Jewish stores were lying on the street or in the canals, the synagogues were burning, the books were burning. And today I'm reminded of Heinrich Heine's words, when they are burning books, they will burn people. And that remark was made more than 200 years ago. I went with my little sister, and it was explained to us, it was a night of broken glass of the Stalk Nach. All men between the ages of 16 and 65 were picked up by the German secret police and sent to a concentration camp near Berlin. They returned six weeks to six months later. Thin, drawn, missing front teeth, shaven heads. They did not talk. They did not tell. But they left the country as soon as they could, with or without family. <coughs> My father returned from Poland in May 1939. He still went to school. The classes had become very small. And we tried desperately to get papers to go abroad. My mother had a brother in San Francisco, but he declined papers the excuse I cannot take care of a family of four. He assured him that he would work, but he did not send papers. I met him in 1946, but I was unable to talk to him. I was very angry. On September 1st, 1939, the radio announced that Germany had invaded Poland, and Germany was at the <coughs> At six in the morning, 
My father was picked up as an enemy alien and taken to prison. For two weeks, he was treated as a foreigner <coughs> under the Geneva Conventions. After two weeks, Poland had lost the war. It was fully occupied. My father was sent to Sachsenhausen and to Dublin afterwards. We heard from him very seldom. It was one line. I'm well in his signature. I was in Dachau last year, and I got access to the files that they had, they had about my father, and I made photocopies. They were very contradictory. My father was murdered in Dachau on January 31st, 1941. The paper stated that he died in Munich that he died of pneumonia. Another paper stated that he died of heart failure. In any event, he was murdered, which I was way not able to it. I have the documents now for my children. We had to move from building to building. The Germans designated certain areas, certain houses, in which Jews could live. And we had to vacate our apartment and move a room in one of these houses. Food by then was rationed. It was sold in special stores. Our cards were marked with a large J. The rations were limited, and the wait for food was very, very long. On February 1st, which happened to be my birthday, the German secret police came to our, you know, to our room. They threw a cigar box on the table and they said, ashes from the whole Benjamin Manda. Whether they were my father's ashes or not, we will never know. However, they were buried in the Jewish cemetery in the city of Denver and he set stone <coughs> whether it's my father's ashes or not. He will not know it and it really doesn't matter. <coughs> A short time then, in the summer of 1941, we received notification for deportation. One suitcase per person. The deportation was peace. We were loaded at the Hanover Rail Station, which is today a museum. It was opened last week. We were put into cars with guards from the outside, and we were in 50 people. After three days, we arrived in a city named Birch, L-O-D-C, in central Poland, a city we had not heard much about, it was not near the place where my parents and grandparents had lived. We were pushed out of the railway at pass and handed over to the ghetto police. They were Jewish like we wore a yellow star, and they walked us into the ghetto, which was the Baluti section, a large industrial city. The poorest worst section of the city that you could imagine. It had no run the apartments or the rooms. It had no running water. It had no toilets. It had no bathrooms. You had to carry water up from a pump. It had uh, three pots, wooden pots for eight people. It had a small stove, but no coal, no wood, and the food was severely rationed. Food was to be collected at intervals, which were irregular. If you see just frozen potatoes, a hundred gram of sugar, flour, a loaf of bread for seven days, which after three years was a loaf of bread for two weeks. It was a round loaf, and it was usually eaten within a day or two. The rest of the time, you remember, or you ate tar or water. People ate grass, people ate leaves, and I will receive as a birthday present from a friend a bag of potato peels. I washed them, I ground them. 
disappeared. We were told they were in another work camp and they were fine, but nothing got into the ghetto. We had one radio and it didn't always work. And there is no information, there was no information as to what had happened. That same year, July, my mother died of hunger. There were no services available to bury the dead. They were stored in a large building at the ghetto border in the Jewish <coughs> cemetery. My sister and I walked out there. We found my mother. We dug a grave and we buried her. I've tried since to find the grave, but there are no numbers, no records. And so far, the polls have not been successful. Shortly thereafter, the Germans decided that they wanted to get rid of all the elderly, anybody over 60, all children, and there were about 10,000 children under the age of 13. They wanted to get rid of all the unemployed because Work was voluntary, it was not demanded. And it had the advantage that you got a suit, a thin walking suit at lunchtime. You did not get paid extra, but you got a suit. My sister was at <coughs> home, 12 years old. She was tall, and I assumed, or it was assumed, the 12 year olds would not be deported, and I dressed her up to look older. I put makeup on her face and lipstick. And we had to line, we had to stay in our rooms for seven days. The Germans went from street to street with guns, with dogs, and with any personnel, the Wehrmacht and the Gestapo. When they came into our courtyard, we had to line up and they picked the people they deemed unfit for labor. All the elderly, my sister, among the young ones, I wanted to go with her onto the truck, but they didn't permit it. This transport numbered 20,000 people. They disappeared. We never heard from we never knew what had happened. It was claimed that some clothing, which was blood-stained, came back into the ghetto to be washed and to be sent to Germany. But it was never proven that it was for mistransport and that it was accurate. Life in the ghetto continued. Some people used the bread cards of the, of the people that were deported. Some took, but it was illegal to keep the bread cards, and eventually they confiscated them. The bread rations got smaller and smaller. In the three and a half years, I did not see milk, I did not see an egg. I only saw once horse meat and a little. I did not see any kind of food. I had jaundice, I had typhus, I had gallstones. It was an impossible life, and I wasn't the only one. The ghetto cemetery marks 70,000 dead. But this is not all. They counted, they miscounted, and they did not count those that were deported and sent out of the ghetto. Did not survive. We worked for the Germans in factories. They bought in machinery and we sold the uniforms for the German army. We, did, we made the boots for the army. We made furniture for the children in Germany. We made hats for the ladies in Germany. You name it, it was made in the ghetto. And the letters of the stores that bought the merchandise are now available and they are on display. And they paid very little for the merchandise and they said it was very good workmanship. Lodge was a city of 
famous shoemakers and it was known for good merchandise. I worked in several offices. I worked first in, a, in an office for a man who was an engineer who believed in the unification of the ghetto. He thought it would be a permanent home with gardens, with schools, with parks, and he had a staff and crew of blueprints. Bunkowski permitted the office, and after six months he closed the office. I guess he saw the futility of this effort. Then the second office, and we were drawing up, we were counting German forms for figuring out the poor life for the German population. We had, for the one summer, 300 people filling out the forms and sending them back to Germany so that they could get the proper amount of coal for the winter. The shoe, straw shoe factory, which made straw shoes for the German army, for Russia in the snow, had too few employees. Wolkowski came to the office and took 70% of the employees out of the office and into the straw shoe factory. You were braiding the straw, which was wet, with your hands. Your hands were swollen and bloody, and it was terrible work. It was worse than the carpet factory. When he went through the office, person by person, and I tried to hide, but in the end I could not. And he wanted to know about the family, and he said, you'll hear from me. I had a very good boss, he was a lawyer by profession, he was in his thirties, and he transferred me to the office of archives, where we made out a daily report of the happenings in the ghetto. His thought might have been if I would disappear in the other office, maybe Rukowski would not remember. I worked there for Dr. Singer, who came from Prague, and we filled out a page or two pages of ghetto occurrences every single day from 1941 to 1944. The papers were found partly in March, partly in March. They were photocopied, they were sent to a university in Germany, and we had five volumes of the daily reports. It tells how many people committed suicide, how many people were dead, who was punished or confessed, who was shot at the barbed wire, and it gave a report of generally what the population was talk talking about. If you read the reports now, they are worded rather carefully. But if you live there, you know what it meant. Because the <coughs> daily reports were censored by Lukowski and by the Germans. And we did not take chances. But the papers are available now. You can read them, you can see them. We can probably not in English as yet. And the ghetto kept is existing. We did not know what was happening in the world. We did not know that the Russians were approaching. We did not know that uh, the Germans had withdrawn from Russia. We only saw a red sky once, and we heard guns, and that was the burning of the Warsaw Ghetto. We lived totally isolated. The ghetto was surrounded by barbed wire. It had no underground canal canalization. And the refuse ran down along the gutter. We had to jump over it. I have never seen anything quite like it. The ghetto existed more or less and the dead lying on the, in the morning street. 
They are more frequent than the men more. The little black wagon to the white horse would pick them up every day. The Germans decided in both the ghetto is the one they had to control, and there were many. There was Minsk, there was Koslo, there was Vilna, there was Lugia, uh, there were many of them. This ghetto was the longest in existence until August 94, when the orders came from the Germans that the ghetto had to be evacuated. And they evacuated street by street by blocking off streets and having us walk to the end of the ghetto, which had a so-called rail station, or rather it had rails that stopped at the end, but it did not have a station. And they had cattle cars lined up, each cattle car for 150 people. And we had a small window on the top, and the cattle cars took off in August, the first ones, I was in the first one to the friend. And after three days, they arrived at four in the morning at a station, well lit, with a lot of dogs, a lot of commands in German. And as the doors were open, they were in a place called Auschwitz. There were some prisoner help us <coughs> and we asked them where are we? And they were amazed that we had never heard of Auschwitz. Auschwitz had been in existence for already three years. The old were separated from the young, the men, from the women, the children, from the parents, unless the mother did not give up. And by evening we had lost all our belongings for the little we had taken. Our heads were shown. We walked to a shower, which was either called a shower or gas. On that day, it gave a little bit of water. We received one bag of clothing, an apron and all the rest of that. No shoes, no underwear, nothing. And through the grapevine, we heard that Auschwitz had a gas chamber. and we saw the billowing chimneys. We had never heard about it. We were in a barracks of the size of this room, 500 women. Every morning, every afternoon, we had to line up and be covered. <coughs> At first, it was very cold in the morning, and then it got very hot. People fainted. People were sent to the hospital. Some of them were in church. We had heard of a Dr. Mengele who made experiments on human beings, but we had not seen him. One morning he came with another officer. We had to line up, take off our clothing, and run past him, or walk past him. We were pushed to the, to the left with a stick, and those on the right were marched away never to be seen again. The ones on the left, Came another, got another bag of clothing, were put into a cattle car, and after three or four days, we arrived in the outer, outer harbor of the city of Hamburg. <coughs> the minute I thought, going back to a place that I knew four years ago <coughs> might be a hell, I was greatly mistaken. We were used as slave labor. We lived in the uh, in barracks, at first on the floor, and then they had wooden pots and a straw sack. We received a slice of bread in the morning, a black liquid, and a hot soup at night. We worked through the whole winter of 1945 at the um, shipyards, at home of buildings, and uh, we built temporary housing for the Germans out of concrete uh, walls. We did every labor conceivable. Everybody had pneumonia, everybody was sick, but it was better to be sick 
than to be sent away. This particular camp had 497 women, two from Czechoslovakia. The two women that were appointed for the inside running of the camp were from Prague. I was the only <coughs> one who really spoke German. Everybody else was from Poland. And the camp was surrounded by barbed wire and barracks for 42 SS. The camp was run by several SS people. One succeeded the other. One more cool than the next one. The last one we had was a gardener in civilian life. Now he wore a uniform. He was in his 50s, late 50s. He wore high boots and he loved to kick us. I had bloody legs for weeks. As soon as they would heal, he would kick and the wounds would break over, would break open. And he did not talk to us other than some commands. For a short period, I worked in the office because they did not have enough people to write down things. They did not have a typewriter. And I read the newspaper, which was on another desk, upside down. It didn't give me much information. Out of the workplace, the Germans did not look at us. In the street car, in the, uh, in the bar trains, they did not look at us. We stood in a corner, ragged, wet, unnourished. Nobody acknowledged us. There are now papers available that on the way to the train every morning, people would stop and leave food on the, on the edges. The only problem is we never saw any food. That's a story that has been fabricated now together with many other stories. It was a long winter. It was a hard winter until about March 1945, we were loaded into trucks, and the next stop was a place called Berlin Dorsum. I haven't heard of the place. We went through a big gate, and on the right and on the left were huge mountains, or 10 feet high, of shoes, empty shoes. No feet, no legs, just shoes new and old, small and large. We were housed in the barracks, this size, very small, right in the village. The dead were lying on the road. There was a large area in which the dead were naked, tired high, and turning green. Their bodies were turning green. The first two days or three days, we received a little bit of soup, nothing else. The SS no longer came into the camp because it had a, an epidemic of typhus. We knew that they there was very, very short and very limited. You could not survive without food and the typhus all about you. On April 15, 1945, we heard a strange noise. That was around lunchtime. We came out of the barracks and saw <coughs> big vehicles on the main camp avenue behind barbed wire. And out of the vehicles came soldiers in cattle. There were soldiers from Great Britain on the way north to cut off the Russians. They had not anticipated to stop at Berlin Dotson, or that it even existed. They were speechless. I worked for them from the first day <coughs> as a translator. I spoke English then already. And the news that was relayed to London that day in the weeks can be heard and seen at the uh, Museum in London. 
They tried to bring in food, medical help, but it took time. The war was not finished. The war was finished in May. This was April 15th. Eventually, we got some food. The barracks were eventually burned down, and we were housed in the German military stone building. <coughs> And they buried the dead. They found more than 10,000 unburied dead. And the dead were buried with the bulldozer. There was no unburied. The mass graves are identified, but not the people. You can see them now, where again Belsen has a new museum, which is very detailed and very well done. And 9,000 died after liberation because they could not be saved. They were too far gone that any medical treatment could make a difference. My only thought was to get out of Germany. I tried with my family in Palestine. I tried with my uncle in San Francisco, a classmate in New York, and their people. I worked for the British War Crimes Department. We interrogated Germans, mainly military or SS. And one day I mentioned that I remembered the SS at the previous camp. My boss left. He gave me a pad and a piece of paper, and I wrote down the notes. A few weeks later, he said the information out would you come with us in the truck and we'll go to Germany, we'll go to the German cities and find them. Of the 42, we found 40. They were arrested and all of them all of a sudden knew my name. I only knew to have a number. We have never done anything bad. Please help us. I have no answers, no comments, no answers. I just wanted to see them behind me. There was a preliminary hearing in the city of Zelle. All I remember is that I spoke English. I don't remember the questions. I don't remember my answers. And I saw the SS sitting in front of me. They and then I received letters or scraps of paper under my door. We will find you, we will see you. I assumed that they were from the families of the imprisoned SS. When I gave them to my boss, I cried. And it was really the first time in years that I had cried. I was afraid. Two days later, the British drove me over Holland to Belgium first, because Paris had a British embassy and an American embassy. They gave me a, uh, a letter of recommendation that I had helped them. And they said, good luck, and try and get a visa out of Europe. On March 26, 1946, I arrived in New York. I was about six months in Paris. It was very hard to get a passport, to get a boat, because I had no plans to take, to go to New York. It was difficult. New York was lonely. My classmate was trained, but she said you have to go to work. I worked in a glove factory. I hated it. At the end of that year, I met my husband. We got married. I started to work in an office, and I was in typing and I went to Queen's College at night. We left New York in 1949 for San Francisco, and we lived in Berkeley since 1950. My children were born in this country, and they tried to visit Germany when they were students, and they said, it's not a country for us. The people don't look strange. I can't cope with that. 
It was very strange because we had not told them about the past. They knew they had no grandparents, but they didn't know why. We told them when they were 18 years old, and they never asked a question, and we never gave an answer. They read my first book, which came out in 1990 or 1992. There's still no questions. It is a topic which we just cannot discuss, because everybody cries instead of talks. A while ago, the German said, would you care for a German passport? We would even give one to your children. I said, you know, my children would kill me if I came home with a German passport. And do you know what I would do to, to it? I would show it. And there was a senator, and he was very insulted. So be it. It is 64 years later. They have learned a little. The students like you, I can only tell them that you have to have the courage of your convictions. You have to hide somebody if it's necessary. And if it endangers your life, so do it. In the city in which I grew up, close to three million people, nobody was sick. Nobody. In Berlin, yes. In other cities, no. It is a mentality which I find difficult even three generations later because I get now the point my grandfather or my great grandfather tells a different story. My only comment says they went to school, but of course I never see him. And that some of the Germans have become very right wing and very much within the old system is frightening. I'm not saying it can't happen again, it can't happen any place. It happened in Yugoslavia, it happened in Africa, <coughs> it could happen here, it could happen in Germany. If you let it. So it's up to you to never let it happen again. You want to do anything? If you just, um, before we uh, pause for questions, we're going to, uh, we have a, a DVD of a program that Lucille participated in that was about um, Heinrich Himmler as the subject, but um, Lucille was um, also interviewed in it. But, Hope, can we go through it from, from chapter six? Or do you want to go through what what chapter are you on? I think it's on fourteen right now. Okay, why don't you start then? It's coming up, we'll take it a minute. <coughs> okay. Take the, the volume down and then Lucille will provide a little bit of comment. This is a part of the ghetto. You can see still the children at the very beginning when I came. You can see the people emaciated, tired, aimless. You can see the rundown buildings, the streets without any, any canonization, the dirt running around the street, the uh, some of the photographs were taken by the Germans. Some were taken by Grossmann. Walked two years ago. I lived in this building. It was one of the few stone buildings on the third floor to the right of the balcony. It was Pavia 26. The building is now occupied by Poles. They have an apartment, or there are three apartments on each floor. We only have a room on each floor for eight people. Where the car is standing now used to be a pump for water. 
and where the white car is in the back used to be the outhouses. Are this you inside? Is the inside. This is my little sister. This was 1938. My mother, my sister and I. On the right is Heinrich Himmler, on the left is Hitler. Heinrich Himmler had full command of all Jewish matters, of the ghettos, and of Auschwitz. His orders were primary and nobody dared disobey. Can you go to 14? Or uh, 16, please? This is a place called Kulmhof or Helmo in Polish. This is where all the transports from the ghettos taken the people were gassed, the people were put into these open graves and burned. There are no remnants except for an occasional earring or an occasional pins. Why the Poles decided to leave them open, the graves open, we do not know. This is the so-called railway station. Now it's a railway station. It wasn't at that time. Himmler made one visit to the ghetto, but we have no details. We were transported in these cattle cars to Auschwitz and from Auschwitz. One of them stays, stays now in Poland inside the ghetto and uh, it's on display. It's similar to the one in Washington, D.C. It's the old locomotive. It's in Radegast, which was the German name for the railroad station. It had no paving. It had just a dirt road. It is now a so-called monument or a place of remembrance. These are the tracks that are remaining that took us from the ghetto to Auschwitz and from wherever we came from into the ghettos. There is not too much left of it, but some of it. The surrounding is quiet and does not give an indication of what was hidden behind. This is a ramp at Auschwitz, a rival at Auschwitz. You can see the SS guards. This is a Hungarian transport which came in 1942. The striped uniforms are, are uh, prisoners that had to help the Germans. And while the railroad tracks were never bombed by the British or the Americans, it's not to be explained because they bombed the oil refinery in Krakow three miles away. And they knew what was there because we have now aerial photographs which were taken by the Americans. This is Birkenau. This is Birkenau. Yeah. I think a couple of barracks are standing. This was electrified wire with guard towers. and part of a chimney is standing.
I think this was Auschwitz and it could have been the camp of Sinti and Roma, which was burned people inside and they were murdered, but we had no exposure to them. These are the early barracks which had cots. When we came, there were no cots. They had disappeared. You can see a picture of Elie Wiesel looking out of a cot, but they did not exist when we came in 1944. In these barracks were housed more than 500 people. And this is the SS, it's Himmler again, giving orders of praise. Praise, I guess. Can we go to 25? And this is Belgen Belsen, with the mass graves. This is a memorial stone at the entrance and I put down a small stone, as you do in a cemetery, and then I walked away towards the mass graves. Thank you, Thank you. If you have any questions, I will try to answer. Survived the war 
and lived below the poverty line in Turkey, in Israel, and in Eastern Europe. And I think it's a journal's responsibility to take care of those people, to live at least in a decent room with food, and they do not. And that's unforgivable. Many elderly Holocaust survivors lack um, <coughs> even the most basic medical um, health, um, you know, health. Um, they really, especially in Europe, suffer. There are several organizations that raise money specifically to help um, the Holocaust survivors who live in Eastern Europe and in Russia. when I came, and he talked to my husband, but I couldn't talk to him, and I never did. He wanted to have a family, and I couldn't pull that out. How did people keep their sanity? I think you just mentioned how did not. There were there are social workers after the war, there were no psychologists, there were no psychiatrists. You have people now, 85, 90 years old, needing mental health, just like the soldiers returning from Iraq, except we didn't get it. When we came to this country, and I came very early, we were considered socially not acceptable. Nobody asked us where we came from, we were just somehow dirty. I know that my husband's family was very unhappy when my husband was dead. Not his parents, but his aunts, uncles, and cousins. It's a matter of too little, too late. One of the things that I've studied is um, <clears throat> I've heard about several uh, mental facilities in Israel where elderly Holocaust survivors live. Um, and it became very clear to me, people who were able and who had survived uh, enough to take care of themselves, figure out a way to get to the United States, to get to Canada, to get to Australia, to get, in some cases, to Israel. But many of the people who, I guess, were lost in life were automatically taken to Israel because every Jew had a right to be there. And that there are less and less, but many of them lived, lived out their lives in mental institutions because they were never able to live a normal life again. I had a friend who never left her room. The curtains were drawn. The <coughs> pictures of her family were up, but she wouldn't go out. I had another friend who would go out, but he wouldn't go out alone into the street. He had to hold somebody's hand. He would not cross the street. He was terrified. And he was a school teacher by training. So it's very, very difficult for some people. I should add on to that because my own and opa are from the Netherlands and even to this day, even though they live in San Diego County, they will not go to a grocery store where they have to have a membership, where if they swipe and a card. Because they don't like a card identity. Yeah, yeah so they, won't they, won't, they, won't, yeah, they won't do anything that will identify them. They just now, this, in the last like two years, got a cell phone, got a debit card. They always paid in cash, they never got a card for anything, they never wanted to be associated with it. I won't go to any conference, to any meeting with a name tag. No name tags. Did you have a question, Barbara? Yeah, I, I'm wondering, Germany has had a concerted effort to provide education to the next generations um, about the Holocaust, and I think 
if I've gotten my information accurately, have done it in a much more systematic fashion than we have in the United States. And you back and forth quite a lot over the last number of years. Are you seeing any differences in terms of the impact of that education on the generation that are, is the same as the, that, that of our students? It is selective. The students now in Germany are very mixed. There are Turks, there are Greeks, there are Armenians. Germany is not a totally white, blue-eyed country. And that, I think, has made a difference. I see a difference, and I don't see a difference. The German government, six months ago, passed a law that if you could prove that you worked voluntarily in a ghetto, you could get a one-time payment of 2,000 euros which was at that time two and a half thousand dollars. I broke that down into three years, 12 months per year, 52 weeks, eight hours a day, six days a week. It came out to 18 cents an hour. And I wrote a letter which was published in the leading newspaper that Mrs. Merkel should take some arithmetic lessons. <laughs> Actually, there have been some systematic Holocaust education in the United States. And are, have any, did any of you have Catholic high school? Did you have Holocaust education in your Catholic high school? No. Well, on the university level, uh, many of the um, programs in Holocaust education are done at Catholic universities which is kind of complex thing. I had a question, and I wanted to know, I've always wondered, how did you learn all those languages? Uh, my kids speak a good English, a poor French, and a poor Spanish. <laughs> when I was 10 years old, I spoke German, and I spoke English, because I was taught. My French was poor at 12, and it was poor when I lived in Paris. But when I lived three years in Poland, I picked up Polish. I could speak it fluently, but grammatically not always correct. I could not read it. I could not write it. I never went to school there. And my husband spoke even more languages. He spoke French, German, Spanish, and some Portuguese, and later on Italian. So either you're interested to learn them, or you have a natural ear for it. I don't know. My kids just murder any other language. <laughs> any more questions? Oh. You need to speak up. Have you come in con into contact with any of the other Jews that were in the ghetto with you? Like maybe people you worked with in the ghetto or? I have come, well, I have a friend whom I met in the ghetto who lives in Minneapolis, but we are of very different opinions. She talks about the past constantly, even to her children, and I do not. And she also had a privileged status because her father used to be a school principal. I have a friend in Israel who is blind now who absolutely refuses to mention the past. Her brother in London, on the other hand, will talk and will help with translations. So it is very, very different. In the book, you said that. In the book that you, you said that um, you had met your husband's parents. I how, met my husband's parents in the ghetto. How was he in New York, and they were? Pardon? How was he in New York? Why was he in New York? Why and was they he were? in New York? My husband was in Cuba on an illegal entry, on an illegal visa, and the ship after his was the St. Louis, which was turned back to Europe. Cuba did not let him in. 
The visa my husband had was bought, it was illegal, it was not valid. But he went into Cuba, he worked as a farmer, and two years he got to the United States in 1941, and he went voluntarily into the army. He wanted to parachute, but he was too old, because he was looking for his parents. And he was four years overseas, but I did not meet him overseas, I met him in New York. Do you still have the watch that the Russians gave you? No British. Do you still have the watch the Russians gave you? No British. No British. No, I got rid of it. I didn't want it. That I did not want. I have an old watch that doesn't work that belonged to my mother, which was in Palestine and was sent to me years ago. But I did not want that watch because it would belong to another human being and that human being would recognize the watch on my wrist, I would feel off. I did not want it. Hi. How did your um, experience affect your faith? I was brought up traditionally, I would say almost orthodox. I went to a parochial school. I spoke Hebrew, which I forgot, but I still sort of remember. Um, I can read and write it. I am Jewish. I do not go to services, hardly ever, maybe once in five years. And I can only ask, and nobody has found an answer yet, why did the God, why did the God whether he is Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish, Left the Sabbath. And nobody has been able to answer that question. So there's very little place. There's some, but very little. Thank um, Yes? Um, you said that you changed your name to Lucy when you moved to New York. Do, does your, do your family and your intimate friends, do they refer you, to refer to you as the seal, or do you use your um, My name used to be Cecilia, and for short, they called me C-I-L-L-I, -L -L -I, which in English you can't do because it sounds silly. <laughs> so my friend would make it you seal Cecilia, and not knowing any better, I did it. If I had to go over, I just would leave it at Cecilia. But at that time, I, I didn't know. I did think that people in New York told me, because I didn't know. I assumed that, for instance, <coughs> New York had no discrimination in 1946. Mm -hmm. I was interviewed for a job, and the man said to me, I don't hire Jews or Italians. I was speechless. In 1947, when we got married, we went to Canada. Niagara Falls in Canada. French mountains, which are French. And I picked up a brochure at the desk and I read it carefully. And it said, restricted clientele. And I assumed in my stupidity that it meant, well, you had to have a certain education or certain amount of money. And when I showed it to my husband, he said, I'm sorry, I did not see it when I made reservation. It means no use. So those were my disappointments here. But it's still a better place to live than most other places. Yes? Um, I'm really curious because I encounter these I encounter these types of people um, not too often, but I want to know how, what you have to say to those who doubt that this happened. Deniers. People who deny the Holocaust? Well, that was recently a large issue with the Argentinian bishop and the Pope. And uh, I think the Pope should have dismissed the bishop because he certainly has the power. And the Pope, even though he's German by birth, should have known about the past. In fact, there is a future 
of the present court in a German Hitler Youth uniform. So he can't be that ignorant. If I were to encounter a denier, I would just walk away. You give it that much stupidity. <laughs> I was once asked whether I would have a lecture by a Holocaust denier, and guess what I did? I denied it. Um, it is the policy of Holocaust scholars to just not engage people who no. are that. It's useless. It's pointless. It's, they come with such stupid arguments. Irving, who lost the uh, the trial in London two years ago was in Berkeley at IHOPS. Most of the students. It, it was insane. I mean, how can you deny that today is, is Tuesday, 5 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last chance. Um, I'm sorry. Yes, um, I don't really actually have a, a question about your book, but I just found it particularly moving, and I was wondering if you would be willing to sign it. For Thank me. you for that, because that was the next thing I was going to say. I asked Lucille if she would be willing to sign your books, yes. and she's more than glad to do that. Would you join me in Lucille for a second?